So um, this is a recording of the 10-1 lecture um, that I would give live to students using the prepared notes. Um, the, this lecture is gonna cover um, uh, the basics of parametric functions and some calculus having to do with parametric functions. Um, let's start with this idea that a parametric function or a parametric curve, I should say, um, a, uh, a parametric curve is defined as X and Y being, um, being functions of some third variable T, which we call the parameter. So X is a function of T, in this case, it's cosine T. Y is a function of T, it's sine T. And um, if we were asked to sketch each of the curves based on these the values that the parameter takes on from zero to two pi, well, we might make a list. And that list would be something like when t is zero, x, which is cosine of t, would be one, and y, which is sine of t, would be zero. And if we go over here, and we go over to one comma zero, we can plot that point. Um, we might say, well, what goes on at pi over two? Well, at pi over two, cosine of pi over two is zero and sine of pi over two is one. And we're gonna be up here at zero comma one. And we've got something going on in between there. And it goes, as t gets larger, it goes in that direction. If we go on to pi, we find that cosine is negative one, but sine is zero, which takes us over to this point here. And again, we get there somehow. And then two pi will take us back to zero and one. Oops, sorry, not two pi, three pi over two um, will take us to zero comma negative one just down here, kind of looks like that. And again, continue to move around that way. And then lastly, if we go back to two pi, um, two pi is not equal to zero, but two pi will take us back to our initial starting point. And so we've got this graph, okay? Um, we know some points about it. Maybe we can get a little bit more insight if we take a look at this um, on uh, the calculator. So uh, let's uh, add to our calculator a graph screen. Let's go to menu and let's choose graph edit, entry edit, and change our mode from function mode to parametric mode. And we can see here, there's a spot to put in the X uh, function, which is cosine and it's a function of t. And then here we can put in sine, and it's a function of t. And we look down below, and there we have it, the values that t takes on from zero to approximately two pi. And we hit enter. Well, um, how about we zoom in a little bit on that? Uh, option four, let's, uh, let's zoom in right there. Okay. And I went a little too far. Let's zoom back out just a little bit. And boy, that looks a lot like a circle. And it looks a lot like a circle because it is. Um, it is a circle because a couple of things you could bring to mind. Uh, item number one, when you learned all about the unit circle, you learned that the x value was the cosine. You may have used the, 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 the symbol theta for the angle coming off of the positive x-axis. Um, and you learned that y is sine, and that is the production of the unit circle. Now, the other thing we could look at is we could say, you know what? Um, I know the, the Cartesian or the rectangular uh, definition of the unit circle. Uh, it's x squared plus y squared is equal to one. Well, in here, x squared or x is cosine of t and y is cosine is sine of t. 
And if we square them, we get cosine squared t plus sine squared of t. Is it go up? Wait, one equals one. Ah, that's truth. That's a tautology. That says that this expression and these expressions are totally in sync with each other. All right? Great. What about what about another curve? What about a curve? That's defined by x is 3 cosine t. And y is 2 sine t. Well, we could try some values out here. Uh, I think we get 3 here and a 0 there. Let me go ahead and get a piece of graph paper ready there. Let's go over 3. Over, okay. At pi over 2, we're at 0, but we're at 2 then. And we got something going on over here, something like that. Uh, at pi, we're at negative three, but that's going back to zero. Just like that. And again, we're moving around there with a particular direction. And then at three pi over two, uh, we're at zero comma negative two. And this thing is looking more and more like a football or a rugby ball. And, oh, at pi over two, we're back where we were. Gosh, we end up where we started. Oh, wait, but it says to go from zero to four pi. So what would happen if we went another time um, with more values? Uh, how about uh, the, what, four pi, five? How about five pi over two, which is exactly ends up putting us exactly in the same location as um, as we were when we were at uh, a pi over two. At three pi, we are in the same location. At, uh, what would the next one be? Uh, six, six pi over two? No, 7 pi over 2. Yeah, 7 pi over 2. We end up there. And at 4 pi, we end up there. So what do we have here is that this parametric curve may trace over itself. Maybe that's an important idea that we um, we need to, uh, to take into account. Um, last on this one, what do we think we got here? Well, let's go back to my, let's go back to the calculator. Um, let's go ahead and change that previous graph. Represent the new graph. And did I miss something there? Oh, I put the two in the wrong spot. Let me put that in the right spot. Boom. And let's put the two out in front. Boom. And then enter. Okay. Um, Let's, uh, let's do this in a standard, okay? And it looks ovalish. Perhaps it's a um, perhaps it's, it's an ellipse. Perhaps it looks like an ellipse because it is an ellipse. So, how would we prove that? Well, how about the idea that this ellipse would have been would have been x squared over 3 squared plus y squared over 2 squared as we have a horizontal axis of 3 and a vertical axis of 2, and that's equal to 1. What happens if we plot, put in our values of x and y? Uh, 3 cosine t squared over 3 squared plus 2 sine t squared over 2 squared equals one. Uh, I think we can see what's going to go on there. Nine cosine squared t plus four sine squared t over, and this is over nine, and this is over four, is equal to one. Boom, 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 boom. Cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Yep, we got truth again. So, well, using parametric equations, parametric curves, it sure seems like we can take what are relatively complicated curves 
and be able to get at their um, get at that curve easier, more easily. All right. Um, what about this next one? All right. One more time. Uh, some values for t. And t is going from zero. And this is plot, put those values in three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay. X is the square root of t. That means that's zero, that's one. That's the square root of two. That's the square root of three. And that's two. And y is t minus two. All right. Um, that's going to be what? Negative two, negative one, uh, zero, one, and two. All right. So let's take a look at what that plotted out looks like. Um, over zero, down two. Right there. Over one, down one. Right there. Over square root of two. Square root of two is about 1.4, so it takes me about there. I'm going to go up to zero. Square root of three, one. Square root of three is about 1.7, so I'll go about here and go up one. And then lastly, over two and up two. So I get something that looks like that. Okay. Oh, and it has direction. We started low and we made our way upward. So same idea that parametric curves have direction as you go along it as t gets bigger. Um, and then uh, what do we think we have there? Well, I don't think it's a circle and I don't think it's an ellipse, um, but maybe we can figure out what it is. Um, let's see what we got. We got x is equal to the square root of t and we got y is equal to t minus two. What I really would like is to rewrite this so that I have only x's and y's. Um, why don't I take every instance well let's let's rewrite the y one how about y plus two is equal to t and then that allows me to rewrite x is equal to the square root of t minus two well not t minus two x is equal to the square root of t and t is y plus two that's not a graph I'm really familiar with, unless I square both sides and I get x squared is equal to y plus 2. Or how about y is equal to x squared minus 2? Oh, does that look like half of a parabola that's been shifted down two units? I think it, I think it does. Okay, let's take a quick look at what that would look like on our calculator, just to make sure that we've got everything. I'm going to add another um, graphing page. And again... The default mode is to be in function mode. So let me get this into um, parametric mode. And I'll put in the, the square root of t. And I'll put in t minus 2. And it wants to only go from 0 to 4. So I'll put that in. And sure looks like we've got something that's really, really similar. If I do go into trace mode, menu, uh, trace, and I do a graph trace, you'll see that it's starting with t equals zero. And as t gets bigger, I'm following that motion just like we did when we graphed it. Great. That's some very interesting things about these parametric curves. Let's talk about what's not, we haven't talked about in this. What's the calculus um, behind this? Um, we are going to define dy dx, or the, the, the typical idea of slope for this curve, all right, as dy dt divided by dx dt. Hmm, okay, let's just do a, a quick thing here. What does that mean for this problem? Well, dy dt is the derivative of that with respect to t, which is equal to 1. dx dt would be the derivative of that square root. So bring the power down, reduce the power by 1. I think that square root would end up being um, 1 over 2 
square root t. And if we put that all together, dy dx, which is equal to dy dt divided by dx dt, which is equal to 1 divided by 1 divided by 2 root t. And I think we can see that that ends up being just 2 root t. We want to find the slope at a particular point? Well, how about when? How about when t is equal to 1? When we're down at this point right there. That would be 2 times the square root of 1. It would be 2. Does it look like we may have a slope of 2 about there? Yeah, looks like it could be. All right. Second definition is going to be the second derivative of y with respect to x. That expression that we use for, for discussing about um, concavity and stuff like that. Um, and it says to do that, take the derivative of dy dx and then divide that by dx dt. Now that may seem like a really strange formula um, for you, but if I rewrite this, the derivative of derivative with respect to t of dy dx gives us d squared dt dx. Divide by dx dt is like multiplying by dt over dx. And these dt's cancel, and you see that, at least symbolically, we get that symbol for the second derivative. All right, let's play those ideas forward. Let's consider this curve defined by x is equal to t squared minus 5, and y is equal to uh, 2 sine t. And we're going to do this while t is between 0 and pi. Let's scratch the graph and see what it looks like. Let's see if we can find the highest point, and let's see if we can find all the points of inflection. Now, let's go right to the calculator to do that graph. All right, and again, I'm going to start out by creating another page. Let it be a graphing page. Um, let's switch over back to parametric mode, graph entry edit, and parametric. I'm going to go ahead and put in uh, t squared minus 5. And for y, uh, again, 2 sine t. 2 sine of t. Um, we want to do this only while t is between 0 and pi. So let's go ahead and change that to pi, or approximately 2 pi, to just a single pi. And to do that, I'll hit the pi button. Here we go, pi, and enter. Oh, well, that's a very interesting shape. Kind of looks like a, a air, an airfoil, cross section of a wing of an airplane. All right. And, um, oh, it wanted to be graphed on the viewing window from negative 7 to 7. So let me just adjust that while we're at it. So that's window, window settings from negative 7 to 7. And mm, I'll go up by ones, and then from negative four to four, and hit enter. All right. So there's there's our there's our our graph. Um, where's the highest point? Hmm. Well, how do we find maximums for a curve? Um, I think we do that by looking at derivatives. So let's start off by trying to find the derivative for this parametric curve, all right? Um, dy dt is equal to 2 cosine t. Uh, dx dt is equal to 2t. And that means dy dx is 2 cosine, 2 cosine t over 2t. Cross that off. How about just cosine t over t? Okay, there, there's a um, uh, there's an expression that represents the derivative. Uh, if we want to find the highest point, we want to find a local maximum. Maybe set that equal to zero. And ask the question, when does cosine t over t equal to zero? Hmm, cosine t over t is equal to zero when cosine t is equal to zero and t does not equal to zero. 
All right. So when does cosine t equal zero? If I remember correctly, it's equal to zero when t is pi over two. All right. So what can we do about finding that highest point? Well, it's going to be when it's going to be the x value at pi over two, which is going to be what pi squared over four minus five, whatever that is, and uh, y uh, at pi over two. And sine of pi over two is one, so that's going to equal to uh, two. So we think that this is the point. 2 over 5, minus 5, uh, 2. We think that's the highest point. How can we check? How can we find out if that's, if that's true? Well, let's go back to the grapher for a second. And um, uh, let's go ahead and go and trace that graph. 5, and trace it. And um, I'm going to put in pi over 2 for our uh, <coughs> value of, of t pi over 2, enter. Oh, and it looks like it found its way right to the top of that graph. And I, I'm, not, I'm not able to confirm that that's the right value for x, but I can certainly tell that that's the right value for y. So I think we did have a method by knowing what we know about derivatives of finding the highest point. <clears throat> well, let's go ahead to that second point, part c. Um, how do we find points of inflection? Well, points of inflection, if I remember correctly, it's where the second derivative changes sign, where it's equal to zero and, it, or sorry, yeah, the second derivative changes from positive to negative or negative to positive. So let's go about finding that second derivative. Again, we say it's the derivative with respect to t of dy dx all over dx dt. Right, so the derivative of dy dx, which we found right there, derivative of cosine t over t, all divided by the derivative of x, which is 2t. So I guess I'm going to have to do the quotient rule for the top, that it's <clears throat> bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. And then all of that is going to be multiplied, divided by 2t. So it looks like I've got negative t sine of t minus cosine of t all over t squared multiplied by 1 over 2t. Cleaning that up, negative t sine of t minus cosine of t all over 2t cubed. <clears throat> so uh, point of inflection, when is that second derivative equal to zero? Okay, well, I know it's going to be when negative t sine of t minus cosine of t is equal to zero and when 2t cubed does not equal to zero. Mm. Do I have any good methods for finding that zero? I do not. Not at least analytically. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to use our calculator again and see if we can find a plot where negative t sine t minus cosine t is equal to zero. So let me add another page. Uh, it's going to be a calculator page. And in, in this, oop, add another page. Make it a calculator page. Sorry, a graphing page. <clears throat> Let's use uh, x's instead of t's now. Negative x times the sine of x minus cosine of x, All right? And let's take a look. When is that equal to zero? It looks like it's zero a bunch of places. I'm only interested in what's going on between um, zero and pi. So let me change my window for my window settings from zero to pi, oops, not zero pi, from zero to pi. Looks like there's only one spot where it's equal to zero, 
So I'll go ahead, menu, to analyze that graph. Let's look for the zero. And my lower bound just below it, upper bound above it. And let's expand that value so that we can take a look. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and store, store that. I'll store it into A. All right. And that's where we see a change in the sign in the second derivative. Does that match with where we think there might be a change in the inflection? Um, again, let me go ahead, trace this graph. Let me put in A, the value I just stole from the other one. Oh, does it look like there, there could be a change in inflection, inflection, inflection point there, a change in cavity there? Well, certainly it looks concave down all through there. Could it start going concave up there? Yeah, that seems plausible. That seems plausible. All righty. So last part of this parametric curve discussion. What are the other things that we do if calculus with curves? One of the things that we do is we find the arc length, right? Now, <clears throat> if you recall before, the arc length was given as a integral from A to B of the square root of one, mi one plus dy dx squared dx, or the integral from C to D of one plus dx dy squared dy, and we use one or the other depending on how our how our curve was given. Given, recall that this is all based on the idea that a little piece of arc length can be found by using a right triangle and using the, the Pythagorean theorem to get this particular hypotenuse side, which was dx squared dy squared, and we said for many many little pieces that the um, that the, the the size would then um, allow you to get uh, a really good approximation. If you go to an infinite number of pieces, you get exactly it. Well, and then we did something like, let's multiply this by dx over dx, bringing this dx underneath, and we got some cancellation. You can see that in this case, we're starting with the same idea, but now we're gonna multiply by, DX, by dt over dt, bringing the extra dt under, and that's where those things are coming from. So it's a it's building off of this idea that we already had. All right. How can we use um, this arc length function or arc length expression? Um, well, uh, if we're going to find the if we're going to find the arc length of um, of an asteroid, um, we would do something like, let's find out what dx dt is first. Um, bring down the power, reduce the power by one, multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is a negative three cosine squared t sine t, and then dy dt, uh, bring the power down, keep the inside the same while reducing the power by one, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Um, so our integral becomes, oh, I don't know what my limits of integration are. I don't know what would it take to go around uh, and make uh, make this curve. So maybe what I should do is say, all right, let's try this some values of t. x is the cosine cubed, sine is sine cubed. So zero, that takes me to one cubed and zero cubed at pi over two. This is gonna take me to zero, but this is gonna take me to one cubed. At pi, this is gonna take me to um, negative one cubed, which is negative one. Gosh, these numbers look really familiar. They look a lot like the numbers that we got when we went around the unit circle. And then back to two pi. Hmm. I wonder what this I wonder what this thing looks like if it's if it's just in another version of the unit circle. Maybe. 
Uh, let's take a look. Um, let's add a graphing page. Uh, let's have this be a parametric curve. And we're going to say cosine of t cubed and sine of t cubed. And there we go. So you can see on those corners, we're at those locations, like this would be totally inscribed inside of a circle, but now the sides are kind of are kind of sucked in. Oh, it looks like there's a bunch of symmetry here too. It looks like what's going on in the first quadrant is repeated in the second, the third, and the fourth quadrants as well. Um, maybe we can exploit that. Maybe we can say, I think the arc length is four times from zero to pi over two, which will take care of the stuff that's in the first quadrant, times the square root of, and what do we have here? Again, negative three cosine squared t sine t squared plus three sine squared t cosine t squared dt. Now, it's not unusual to not be able to find the antiderivatives um, for these for these expressions. Now, in this case, I'm pretty sure that we're going to be able to, but it's often not the case. Let's do a little cleanup here. I'm going to get 9 cosine to the fourth t sine squared t plus 9 sine to the fourth t plus cosine, no, times, times cosine, cosine squared t. Let's see, can we clean that up a little bit? Well, there's a nine that's common to both of those. I'm going to factor out the nine, pull it out of the square root, make it a 12 out in front. Now, inside the square root, I have a common sine squared and cosine squared in each term. And when I factor out that, I'm left with cosine squared in the first term plus sine squared in the second term. And of course, that's the Pythagorean identity. So this whole thing here is equal to a big old one. And the square root of sine squared the square root of cosine squared gives me sine times cosine, especially in this interval where t is always positive, and these two values are always positive. I think I'll do a little um, u substitution on this. I'll let u equal to sine, and therefore du is equal to cosine of t dt which shows up right there. So my rewrite becomes the integral of u du. And when, at, when t is zero, sine is zero. When t is pi over two, sine is one. So how about 12 times one half u squared is evaluated from zero to one. That's six times one squared minus zero squared, or just a plain old six. All right. So that completes the normal lecture uh, for parametric. Have fun with the, uh, the assignment.